The movement which began in New York has gone global, from Europe to Asia to Australia. The message is anti-corporate greed, with protesters demanding a fair distribution of wealth. So you feel, Francis, that middle-class prosperity being threatened threatens democracy? I think that democracy has always been supported by having a broad middle class. Uh, the middle class does not always support uh, democracy. So I think in China now, this rising middle class of maybe three, four hundred million people uh, is pretty content to live under the Chinese Communist Party's rule. But I think in Europe and North America, uh, it was the fact that the working class graduated into the middle class in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries that provided a lot of legitimacy and support and, and, and stakeholdership uh, for democratic institutions. And I think the problem that we face now is with the advance of computers, information technology, the automation uh, that uh, takes away low-skilled jobs that has been really devastating cities like Detroit, which uh, went bankrupt this summer. Uh, because it's shrunk from you know a couple million people down to a few hundred thousand, uh, and, and that's a direct symptom of this kind of middle class erosion. And if we end up with a meritocracy, but one that concentrates wealth uh, and influence at the very top and leaves the job opportunities for the rest of the society up for grabs, I think that's not a healthy situation. And I, I think it threatens democracy by uh, inducing populism and a lot of other... Uh, problems. Wasn't communism a middle class project? And, and you argue, don't you, that the tendency to authoritarianism, at least on the left, was also middle class? I, I think it's right that the middle class uh, does not inevitably support democracy. Uh, what the middle class has are great expectations. And I think that you'll see that the leadership of virtually every revolution uh, since the French Revolution, but including the Bolshevik and Chinese revolutions, has been led by middle class individuals whose opportunities for advancement were stymied. And you know, this was a case of people like Lenin and Mao, uh, and also the authors of the French Revolution were mo mostly middle-class lawyers who felt that the old regime was keeping them back. Uh, so it's a, it's a class that I think has the wealth and the security to organize politically, to project ideas. Intellectuals come out of this class. The relationship to democracy really has to do with the relative proportion. And right now, in China, the middle class is just a minority. You know, it's maybe 30% of the population. The theory is not that the middle class inevitably supports democracy, but when you get to a middle class society in which the middle classes are, you know, 80% of the population, then you don't have that fear of the poor rising up underneath you. Then I think uh, you have a much more stable uh, basis uh, of support for democracy. It's pretty hard to describe it, really. You can see uh, one or two fine examples of the shock troops of the new left, members of the veterans of the old left. And right behind me here, a lot of people have never demonstrated before. If you look at the post-1945 period, every major public issue that had universal resonance was born of scrutiny mechanisms, network monetary bodies that subsequently had an impact on government in order the marriage of human rights and democracy that happened at the end of the 40s and the birth of the civil rights movement, peace against nuclear weapons, the student movement, the rebirth of the women's movement, the greening of politics, the politics of disability. All of these grand great ideas and the politics that flowed from them began outside the party system and parliaments and official politics. Now, it's true that laws have to be uh, passed and budgets have to be drawn up and governments have to intervene, yes. But as I see it in this age of monetary democracy, the dynamism has shifted to outside the party systems and that is not going to wither away. These are not cynical, disengaged, inner-city, you know, hair-dying kind of student activists. They're much older than that, and they're much more likely to believe that they can affect change. So they have a high sense of political efficacy. They just have a very low sense that real political change can come out of institutional politics, like parties. So the vision is not a one-party state. Uh, democracy means that wherever power is exercised, 
In the name of equality of citizens, it is restrained, it's chastened. One of the great challenges of 21st century democratic ideals and for Democrats is how to invent mechanisms for dealing with cross-border chains of power, which are wrecking democracies. And if you take the, the case of Europe and the banking and credit sector, it's cross-border, but there are no mechanisms for actually dealing with it. Francis. Well, look, there's been this sea change over the last generation away from traditional political parties and towards civil society organizations. And so I think a lot of what John is talking about is really this rise of global civil society. I see this all the time. My students, you know, when they graduate uh, from the university, none of them wants to work for a traditional political party. They all want to go to some NGO, some activist group. Uh, and, you know, there's definitely a role for these organizations in terms of monitoring, checking, getting information out of there. But it tends to dissipate power. I'll just give you an example again from the United States. You had two populist movements over the last few years. One was the Tea Party on the right, and the other was the Occupy Wall Street movement. All right? uh, they were both very anti-elitist. They both started in civil society as grassroots organization. The Tea Party then went on to basically change the face of the Republican Party in the 2010 election. They got a whole slew of their people elected to Congress, where, I mean, you may not like the effect that they've had, but they are exercising genuine political power. The Occupy movement brought attention to economic inequality, but they had no agenda of actually organizing for political action, and as a result, they've had no influence over, and I think this is the point that I was trying to make, or that you alluded to earlier. The left in the United States is absent because it cannot organize the way the right can organize. Basically, if you want to deal with out-of-control finance, it is only the state that's going to fix this problem. The state, through its regulatory power, in the United States, uh, the, the solution to the too-big-to-fail problem of these large banks should have been the government nationalizing them, breaking them up, and then going back to the old regulatory regime that prevented them from getting as large as they are. Only the state has the power to do that. And in the United States, the state has really been mastered by the financial sector so that as a result of campaign contributions and this incredible lobbying machine that Wall Street has, the American government is not powerful enough to correct this situation. And I'm sorry, but you know, this dissipated monetary left is wasting its energy because unless you get a consensus behind a strong set of state regulations, you're not going to fix this problem. After a cursory reading of their accounts, Shearer made an astonishing discovery that highly paid British officials and international ratings agencies appeared to have missed. It wasn't a proper bank at all. Less than 10% of their profits came from either you know, lending money or um, a, a managing other people's investments. My favourite example from the European region in the last five years is the Icelandic model. Uh, <laughs> you have to be kidding me. Monetary <laughs> democracy in action. Uh, the banks were allowed to collapse. The, oh, the culprits right. were arrested. A prime minister was arrested. Um, there was a change of government. Uh, even a best party, as it was called, won representation. It stood for the principle that no party ever tells the truth, so we're not going to tell the truth. No party ever honours its promises, so we are not going to honour our promises. And better public transport came of it, a middle class that actually was rescued from oblivion. Now, Iceland is Iceland, it's a very small country, but that kind of politics is badly needed in so many European democracies, which are on the skids. If you look at Greece and Spain and Italy, and if you look at Romania and Bulgaria and so on, what we're seeing is a kind of Putinism. We're seeing a kind of drift to authoritarian dictatorship, which is rather reminiscent of the 20s and 30s. If you look across the developed world, just to bring this to kind of pragmatic realities, some countries have done this better. So the Germans and the Scandinavians right now, their model actually looks a lot better than this kind of Anglo-liberal model uh, because they have a corporatist approach to wages. Uh, they negotiate, there's a high trust relationship with their labor unions. They uh, protect the wages of um, 
working class individuals, they keep up the manufacturing skills through an apprenticeship program. Uh, all of these things are not done in Britain or the United States. So they narrow the band between rich and poor. And it, it doesn't solve the problem in, in the long run, but it does, you know, it, it's meant that Germany's been able to keep much more of its manufacturing sector than Britain or the United States have. But can I thank you both? It's been a fascinating conversation. Francis Fukuyama from Stanford University, John Keane from the University of Sydney. You can visit our website to get more information at cbc.net.au slash radio national and look for Late Night Live. <laughs>